This episode sponsored by Brilliant. Learn to think. Here, in the bizarre and wondrous landscape of a cor- Jerry, why is the fish in the shot? It doesn't bother you? All right. Here, in the bizarre and wondrous landscape of a coral reef, during- Jerry, I can't do it. But because we're not talking about fish, Jerry. It's screwing up the whole- Just change it. Thank you. During the nights following a full moon, things get dirty. It's quite beautiful. Almost looks like a snow globe. But, you know, instead of snow, it's ejaculate. This is the beginning of a mass spawning. In near-perfect synchrony, corals release their baby-making bits into the water. With some corals, it's a geyser of sperm, while many others release these bundles of sperm and egg together. <laughs> these bundles are like the pornographic version of a tide pod, <laughs> designed to break apart as they reach the surface of the water. This is the beginning of life. Jerry, why would you show the fish eating it? It's the opposite of life. This is the beginning of life. Resting on the surface, eggs and sperm have an easier time finding a suitable match. And when they do, it's time to make a baby. The newly fertilized eggs begin to divide and grow, looking at times like an albino raspberry crossed with a sneeze. But eventually, they settle on something that looks a bit closer to a fish-flavored Tic Tac. These little coral larvae are covered in wavy wavy cilia that let them move through the water. Because now it's time to find a home. When they reach the seafloor, these little larvae begin to search for a suitable spot. Not totally clear on what the criteria is here. I mean, it looks like a rock. But I get it, it's like where to put your blanket down at a music festival. You want a good view, maybe some shade. You don't want to be sitting next to a group of assholes. But eventually these little picky bastards find their forever home. Now the first order of business is to grow up and metamorphosize into an adult form called a polyp. You know, it's not like the metamorphosis of a butterfly, more like a quivering loogie. Now coral are animals in a group called the cnidarians, which includes jellyfish and anemones. Their body plan is circular, mouth in the middle on top and surrounded by tentacles. Now let's flip it over and look at the bottom, which looks remarkably like the top. But this backside here can fart crystals. The science hippies call it biomineralization, because everything has to be complicated. But here, if you look closer, you can see that they're making calcium carbonate crystals. And then they lay them down underneath that tushy. And that becomes a sort of growing skeleton that this coral polyp sits on top of. Now some coral are content with a single polyp, lazy. But the big reef-building corals have other plans. To grow, polyps create clones of themselves. Sometimes it's a little one that buds off to the side, like if you had a tiny version of you growing on your ankle. Other polyps elongate and then sort of pinch off into two. I don't know, this way feels more stressful. Anyway, how and where these new clones form determines the shape of the growing coral. Each one of those tentacled polyps is an individual animal but they all remain connected by a sort of skin between them. So the living part of coral is just this thin layer over top this skeleton they're growing. Like if you draped a floral patterned blanket over a rock. I mean, I'll tell you what, you better like yourself. You're surrounded by a whole bunch of you, constantly finishing each other's sentences and forget about an argument. Come up with a good insult and it ricochets right back. And you're stuck, you're not going anywhere. But they make it work. They even cooperate, using that thing that brings us all together. Mucus. Let me explain. Just like when they were larvae, the surface of corals are covered with cilia. The cilia are constantly waving around like they were headbanging at a metal concert. And all this waving causes the water on the surface of the coral to move. You can see it better if you spritz some crap over top. Little currents are formed that move the water in particular ways. For example, here you can see that it moves up the ridges that are surrounding a polyp. This movement actually creates a low pressure zone right over the middle of the polyp which creates flow towards the polyp's mouth. So on the surface of the coral, there's these sort of water current highways that connect groups of polyps together. They tried it with a dead one too. <laughs> Very thorough. Didn't work. <laughs> Most likely due to the deadness. But we'll keep you posted. So back to mucus. Corals secrete a lot of it. Sometimes it's thin, like a wipe your nose every second, and sometimes it's thicker, like a lung biscuit. The mucus can trap particles on the surface, and then those water currents can move that loogie around. And this sort of thing comes in handy, like if you get covered by sediment. Don't you worry, mucus can take care of that in a jiffy. You can even use this trick to bring mucusy water to parts of the coral that are at risk of drying out. But as is the case when you're dealing with boogers, some will eventually wind up in the mouth. Oh stop, you've done it too. But for coral, it's actually a legitimate technique. You'll see. Brilliant.org is a great way to learn. 
Listen, you try reading a paper on the fluid dynamics of mucus. You know, that's my Tuesday. And I'll tell you, I'm constantly having to brush up on math and physics concepts to approach these topics. Well, Brilliant.org is a free and easy way to learn math, science, and computer science. It's interactive, and you can go at your own pace, so you can build up your confidence. And that's a big part of learning, building the confidence to approach things you don't understand. And listen, you can do it. Mucus. That's what I tell myself. Every day. <laughs> You can browse through the thousands of lessons that Brilliant has, with new ones added each month. Or you can answer a few questions and Brilliant will match you with content that fits your interest and skill level, from beginner to expert. To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free for a full 30 days, visit Brilliant.org slash Zayfrank, or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Brilliant has been a long-time sponsor, and I'm a fan. Check them out today. Where were we? Oh, right. Polyps will use mucus sort of like a net, catching little creatures that are floating around and then they pull it back into their mouth hole. Mm. I mean, this mucus trick really works. You can try it. Go to a restaurant and sneeze on something, they give it to you. Same, same, but different. Now, you can imagine with all those food-filled strings of mucus around, there might be some healthy competition between those mouth holes. Maybe my favorite is Diaceris fragilis, which has multiple mouths in a single polyp. And look at this, they get all grabby with each other, even though the food's going to the same place. It's like that scene from Lady and the Tramp, except here they're sucking on two ends of a loogie. But there are some polyps that are better at the sharing. If a Stylophora polyp has a little extra food, it'll put it directly into the mouth of his neighbor. It's so cute, it's like if a handshake and a hug had a baby. And look, they all take turns, it's adorable. I mean, you can try this at a dinner party. One person starts with all the food and just make sure you're sitting close. And you know, polyps can share even after they've eaten something. They're connected together on the inside of that blanket they form over top the skeleton. You can see how there's a whole system of canals that connect these polyps together. So food that goes into the mouth of one polyp can find its way to another. Now, tiny things trapped in mucus isn't the only thing on the menu. If they're in the mood for something a bit bigger, they can use these little stinger harpoons that they have inside their tentacles. These cells have a tube inside that's wound up like a spring, and there's a little dart on the end that can deliver venom. Something touches it, the whole thing goes off. Choo! And the tips are often barbed so they can hold on to stuff, like these very unfortunate jellyfish that the polyps ganged up on. I tell you, I would very much not like to die like this, getting pulled into a bunch of tiny mouths and being digested by noodles. Oh, I didn't tell you about the noodles. Here, look into this polyp's mouth. You can see a whole bunch of spaghetti. Those are called mesenterial filaments, and they sort of hang down inside the polyp. But these noodles like to come out and play. Sometimes it's out the mouth, and other times they're poking through little holes in the skin. They're part of the coral's digestive system, and they secrete enzymes which can break down food into something that the coral can absorb. But corals use these filaments for all sorts of things. They use them to clean and disinfect their wounds. They'll wipe themselves down once in a while. It's like if you puked out your intestines and used them like a mop. And of course, because it's nature, they use them to beat the shit well, eat the shit out of each other. You know, they're competing for resources out on that reef. And if things get too cozy, it's like a food fight in the kitchen of an Italian restaurant. I mean, it doesn't really look like it would hurt, more like tickle. But what they're doing is stinging and trying to digest each other. Whoa there, <laughs> that one just got pushy. Anyway, that's what I meant when I said they digest with noodles. For many coral, though, the food they rely on doesn't enter their mouth hole at all. I'm not implying there's another hole, it doesn't go through any hole. Instead, they have a sort of arrangement with another organism. When certain single-celled algae, those brown things, enter the coral's mouth, they aren't digested. Instead, they make their way into coral cells, the transparent ones, and end up in these special organelles called symbiosomes. The algae can create food using sunlight, photosynthesis, like plants. It's a bit like having a tree growing in your ass, Jerry. It's not, and I told you don't write metaphors. So coral have these algae, the purple bits, living inside their tissue. You point that shit at the sun and you get food delivered right to your cells. But the algae can get damaged by too much ultraviolet light, which is part of sunlight. So to protect the algae, coral have these special proteins that can absorb ultraviolet light and kick back out visible light, which means that many coral are fluorescent. Can get a bit tacky, to be honest. It's like coming across the wig of a drowning clown. So if the conditions are right, this roommate situation between the algae and the coral seems to work for them. They give each other nutrients, they can pretend they're at a rave. But when the conditions aren't right, the breakup can be a real bitch. 
A lot of things can stress out a coral, but a big one is abnormally high water temperatures paired with a lot of sunlight. That combo seems to overwhelm the algae's photosynthesis, and they start to produce things that can damage themselves in the coral. When this happens, the algae sort of heads for the exit, and it's expelled from the coral's tissue in a sort of oozing mucus. Sometimes it comes out in little strings like this, or in the case of heliofungia, it's a full-body sneeze. Bleh. So as these brownish-green algae are expelled, the coral's tissue becomes more and more transparent. And that means you can see through to the white skeleton underneath. That's why this is called bleaching. Now if the conditions improve quickly, the coral can reabsorb healthy algae and get back to business. But if the stress is longer term and the algae are no longer supplying it food, the coral will starve and die. It's pretty depressing, isn't it, Jerry? He's dead. I mean, you'd probably get your money back on this dive, wouldn't you? No, of course it's a tragedy. I'm just saying if they're going to charge you for the dive, put some fake plants down there. Just a little effort. I mean, they could do a theme like Halloween with, like, gravestones and skeleton. Well, there's plenty of skeletons, I guess. What's that, Jerry? Can dead coral spawn? Well, I know just the team to ask. <laughs>